Um, hi everyone. Good afternoon. I think it's a, it's about two o'clock um in Indian time, right? It's about five o'clock in Malaysian time right now. Um, a very good afternoon to every one of you. And first of all, before I start my talk, my presentation today, let me just allow me to convey my most um sincere gratitude to I Manager for inviting me to become a speaker for today, especially to Ranisha and his team. I know that they have been working very hard to organize this conference, this virtual conference, um, a virtual conference on electronics and communication. Um, all right, so we are now in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, uh, it's quite unfortunate that I can't be physically in India to meet up with all of you, but I'm, I'm actually quite grateful to iManager to take the initiative to organize a virtual conference so that although we can't meet physically, we can still hook up online to the internet and meet with all of you, um, all the, the researchers in, Indian, uh, in India and around the world. Okay, so without further ado, let me just show share with you my slide. Uh, let me see how I can share the slide, just one short moment. Just one shot, wow. My internet um, line is kind of sluggish. Okay. I hope you can see the slide right now. <laughs> I hope I, um, if you have any problem, do stop me because um, the internet connection is not very stable here um, because it has been raining for the past few days. And uh, I think we have just had a rain last night as well. So, um, so well, the internet has been coming, connecting on and off. So the, the title of my talk today is The Design of an Antenna for Biomedical Telemetry. And I'm Kim Ho Yip, or you can call me Yip Kim Ho. Um, my surname is Yip, so Chinese would like to put their surname at the front, so it's a little bit different. So to stay with the norm, um, you, can, you can shift back my surname to the back, and you can call me Kim Ho Yip. Um, OK, let me go to OK. All right, so this is the overview of my talk today. So first of all, I'm going to give you an introduction about um, some about antenna, some of the fundamental knowledge of antennas, how they work, how they are applied in our daily lives, and how they uh, and also the, how they can be applied in the bi biomedical field. So I'm also going to give you a very brief literature review on different kind of implantable antennas existing around the world that people have already been uh, that people have already developed, and um, and I would also point out what is what are their weaknesses how we can um, cope with these weaknesses, how we can improve it further. And of course, this drives us to come up with a list of objectives, how to cope with the challenges of the implantable antenna design. So I would also show you the theory of um, designing the antenna, the tools that I have used for designing the antenna and the phantom model that we have built to simulate the antenna and also to experimentally test the antennas, um, which include the artificial skin and um, and also how step by step I we built an antenna and tested verify my implantable antennas. So without any discussion is the part where I'm going to show you how what the um, final output, final prototype of the antenna looks like. And of course, I'm going to wrap up my presentation today with a very brief summary on what we have achieved at the end of the day. And of course, the last part is the references of my talk of all the materials that I have used to design the antenna. Okay, let's, without further ado, let me go to the subsequent slide. So um, what is implantable medical devices? So uh, basically IMDs or implantable medical devices are devices which are implanted or embedded into our body into the body of a patient. So the purpose of embedding these IMDs into our body is to perform treatments, therapy, 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 and also to perform information transmission, so communication of information. So in other words, these IMDs would actually extract physiological data from our body, and it will be sent to doctors or any healthcare experts so that they are able to diagnose our bodies accurately. So those are biotelemetry. And of course, we can also use um, these IMDs to perform treatments, such as giving um, medicines, supplying medicines into our internal organs. So those are therapeutics. So doctors can provide immediate medical assistance to the patients with 
with um, all the physiological signals extracting from our body almost instantly. And also, and because of this, IMDs, one very important component in these IMDs are actually the antennas. Without these antennas, we cannot transmit or receive signals or information from the IMDs, from the implantable medical devices. So in other words, besides implanting or embedding medical devices into our body, these devices have needs to have um, an implantable antennas incorporated or um, attached along with it. So there are many different kinds of implantable medical devices that we may come across in our daily lives, especially in the hospital or in uh, patients um, that you can find in the hospital. So some of these are some of the examples, insulin pumps, cardiac defibrillators or pacemakers, cochlear implants, deep brain neurostimulators, gastric stimulators, and foot drop implants. These are just some of the many kinds of um, IMDs that we may use one day when we get old or when we get sick. I'm going to um, give you a brief explanation on, on this kind of, on this um, IMDs one by one, some of the most commonly used IMDs that we may come across in our lives um, in our subsequent slides. So the first one is pacemaker, and this is probably one of the most common IMDs that we may see um, in many of the elderly people. Okay, so pacemaker is um, installed near our heart, and it is meant to um, to regulate the irregular heartbeat. So when uh, when uh, we have heart which is not beating regularly, a uh, uh, kind of symptom which is known as arrhythmia. So normally the doctors would advise the patients to install pacemaker so that it would be able to um, regulate. Um, uh, or perform um, checking, monitoring on our heartbeat and to make sure that the rhythm of the heartbeat would change back to its normal pace. Okay, the second one is implantable card cardioverter defibrillator, on, which is in short known as ICD. So this is actually an enhanced version of the pacemaker. It is for uh, um, patients with more critical heart problems. So especially those patients which um, may encounter um, heart stop, um, heartbeat, their heartbeat may stop anytime, any anytime or anywhere. <laughs> so they are pretty much critical. We, we, are, we may not be able to predict when their heart is going to stop. So if we have this kind of patients, then doctors would normally advise the patients to install or to embed ICD near the uh, heart. You can see that it's actually very near the heart. Um, this ICD would actually jumpstart the heart once it stops and regulate back um, the rhythm of the heartbeat. So you can see that besides um, being able to jumpstart, it also has the functions of pacemaker. It can regulate back the heartbeat um, rhythm. The third IMD is known as a ventricular assist device. So as the, the name indicates, ventricular assist device, it is actually impl implanted near the ventricles of um, the heart. Ventricle is actually the bottom part of the heart. The, the top part is known as the um, atrium and the bottom part is known as the, the ventricle. It is, um, it is some, uh, some hollow chambers which is used to um, transfer um, blood throughout the body. So when our heart becomes weak, especially when we age, when we become old, old and the heart is not beating um, strongly, it becomes weak. So we, doctors would um, advise us to install I, VAD, ventricular assist device, to, um, to help to palpitate the heartbeat yeah, so that uh, the blood is able to transfer throughout the whole, throughout our body. Okay, so, so here's another kind of IMD which is quite common, especially for um, patients which has um, um, high uh, diabetes for diabetes patients, okay? So this is known as implantable glucose sensor. It is used to sense it, um, the sugar level in our body. If our sugar level drops um, to a very low level, then this implantable glucose sensor, IGS, would actually um, 
um, pump in insulin into our body. Okay, so when our uh, when the body the sugar level is too low, that symptom is known as hypoglycemia. Um, okay, so we have implantable neural stimulator as well. This is actually for critical patients. Um, implantable neural stimulator is actually implanted near our spine. It is near, it is at the epidural space between our spine. There is actually a part, uh, one part which is hollow and a tube is actually implanted near that hollow part. And that hollow part is known as the epidural space. So what it actually do is, um, it's actually meant for patients which has, um, which suffer from very critical um, pain, pain which is which cannot be endured, undurable. Um, so what they do is, um, it would actually intercept the pain signal, so that it will not go flow to our brain. So it it actually kind of bluff us when we feel painful, this pain signal would actually be sent all the way to our brain to, uh, to, and then our brain will interpret that signal and tell us that we are actually feeling very painful at certain part of our body. But when it's too painful, um, we might find that it's hard, unbearable. So what they do is, what, what this implantable neurostimulator is, it will actually intercept this pain signal, stop it from being transferred all the way to the, the brain yeah, away to actually bluff our body that we are not feeling painful. And this is normally used when the pain is unbearable. Okay. Um, we also have implantable infusion pump. Well, this, is, this works very much, very much similar like the neural stimulator that I mentioned just now. It, is, it actually helps to alleviate um, the pain that we can feel in our body. But um, unlike the neural stimulator that I mentioned just now, this um, device, it actually sends liquid pain medicine to the body. So instead of intercepting the pain, pain um, signal, it actually sends painkiller medicine to our body to suppress the pain. So we also have gastric electrical stimulation, GES. Gastric um, electrical stimulation is uh, installed to patients which are, who have problem in digesting the food. Uh, a kind of um, illness known as gastroparesis, where um, the patients could not actually empty the food in the stomach. They would feel nausea, they feel like vomiting. So in order to, um, to cure this um, remedy, this vomiting um, problem, the doctors would actually install a GES near the lower part of the abdomen. And this, this device, would actually exercise the muscles, the muscles near the stomach, so that it helps to digest the food in the stomach. Okay, food drop implant is also a kind of IMD, which is quite common, especially for um, patients which has which is suffering from stroke. Okay, from patients who has stroke problem, who cannot pro walk properly. So uh, patients with stroke, especially at the lower part of their body, they might have problem lifting their foot up. So a foot drop implant actually stim stimulates, it actually triggers the nerves near the end of the feet so that, um, so that it would actually increase the strength for the patients to increase the, the foot up. Okay, we also have deep brain stimulator, DBS. Deep brain stimulator is also for a very critical patient patients who are suffering from Parkinson's, dementia, where they can hardly hold their, their thing properly using their hands, they keep vibrating, their hands would keep fidgeting. Um, so deep brain stimulator would actually send signal to the brain to um, restore back the, uh, the nerve signal which has gone awry, which, has, which is not working well. So that um, patients with Parkinson, they would have less vibration when they are holding a certain business, a certain thing such as holding their food or holding their spoon. They would have less vibration and they can eat um, using their spoon. Okay. So cochlear implant is also the uh, kind of IMDs. Um, this is the last IMDs example that I'm going to show you. Okay. So um, this is not like the um, hearing aid device. 
that we come across very often. Um, this is actually for patients who has almost lost their hearing, their auditory um, cap capability. So you can see that in this device, there are actually two components. One is actually installed at outside the ear, the other one is actually installed inside the, the ear. So the component installed outside the ear is, a, is actually a very small microprocessor, a processor which is able to receive signal, um, auditory signal from the environment, the external environment, and then it would process it, change it into digital signals, into electronic signals. And these electronic signals would be transferred to the electrodes here. And the electrode would collect the signal um, and send it to the auditory nerve. So it actually kind of helps patients who has, who has almost lost their hearing um, capability. So you can see that we have these different kind of IMD devices nowadays implanted into our body to help curing or at least alleviating our health problem. And most of this device yeah, actually is installed with uh, an, an antenna inside it. The purpose of this antenna is to allow the device to communicate especially with healthcare experts. So let's have a look at what is an antenna. Why do we need to have antennas in these IMDs? So in short, antennas are actually a transducer, a device which actually converts electromagnetic signals into current or voltages and vice versa. It will also convert current and voltage back into electromagnetic signal so that it can propagate out. So when you collect signal, electromagnetic signal is a receiving antenna. When you transmit the signal out using the antenna, then the antenna operate or works like a, a transmitting antenna. Okay, so here's a diagram which shows how we receive and um, transmit signal from an antenna. So this is a dipole antenna, a, an antenna with two poles, we call it a dipole antenna, which is about half wavelength long. So you can see that before the antenna, before the signal is radiated from the antenna, it, it is actually a current, they are actually in current form, but once it radiates from the internet, it becomes electromagnetic field. And um, here you can see that we have another dipole antenna which works like a, a receiver, a receiving antenna, where it receives the electromagnetic signal and converts it back to current, um, current and voltage form. So um, the electromagnetic signal actually travel at its fastest rate in air, in free space. So the speed of the electromagnetic signal is about, is roughly about um, three times 10 to the power of eight meter per second. Sorry that I forgot to put the unit, it's meter per second. So it's, it's actually, you can actually derive the speed of the um, electromagnetic wave by finding the reciprocal of square root of permeability times permittivity of the medium. So if it's free space, then it's then permeability and permittivity of free space, you square root it and you find the inversion of it, you would get you would get the answer, which is roughly about 2.996 times 10 to the power of eight meter per second. So we always visualize electromagnetic wave propagation in two ways. What it it varies temporary, temp temporarily and it also uh, varies spatially. When it varies in terms of space, um, the electromagnetic signal, when it completes one full cycle, we call it a wavelength. When you visualize it in terms of time, when it varies temporarily, so the electromagnetic signal, when it completes one full cycle, we call it one period. T, expressed in T, one period. And wavelength is expressed in lambda. So this is how an antenna radiates out electromagnetic waves. You can imagine that um, you have two metallic plates connected in parallel, and these two metallic plates are actually separated by a layer of dielectric, which is normally air. This, you can see that there's a layer of dielectric here. So it forms an accumulation of positive charges at the top metallic plate and accumulation of negative charges at the bottom metallic plate. Now, what you can do is you can flip these two metallic plates vertically upwards and downwards. So it becomes like two straight wires joined together and separated by a certain gap here in the middle. There is a certain gap here. So the field between the 
the positive charges and the negative charges would actually radiate out. The field would actually radiate out if the energy is strong enough, of course. If it's not strong enough, then it will still stay there um, and it will decay almost instantly. So we must make sure that the electromagnetic energy is strong enough so that it can radiate out. So at the same time, you can see that we have also current flowing um, along the, this dipole antenna. You have two wires, so they are actually dipoles antenna. Um, antenna, um, the propagation, the radiation field of the antenna can be um, categorized or classified into three different areas. Um, we have reactive near field, which is very near the antenna. And then we have radiative near field, um, which is farther away. And then we have far field signal, which is very far away, which is about. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that here are how we categorize the radiation effect from an antenna. So given that the size of the antenna is about D, has a diameter of D, the, this antenna has a diameter of D. So when the, the distance is square root of D cubed divided by lambda wavelength multiplied by 0 0.62, if it's less than this parameter, then the area is known as the reactive near field or um, non-radiative area. So that means the field are not radiating if it if it's um, confined within this area. If it's uh, if it exceeds this boundary, 0.62 multiplied by square root of d cubed divided by lambda wavelength, then it is known as the Fresnel area, the radiative area. Both of these are are known as the near field. So when the field exceeds 2d squared divided by wavelength, then it's known as the Fraunhofer or far field, where the field starts to radiate away from the antenna. So let's have a look at these three um, categories of distance in more detail. Oh, all right, before this, you, um, here's an, another definition for um, the category of propagation for an antenna. So this, this category is, is especially dedicated for antennas which are less than 0 0.5 lambda, half of the wavelength. So in other words, these, and these are very small antennas. For very small antennas, we actually have reactive near field, radiative near field, and also far field as well, which is the same as typical, kind, typical um, electromagnetic radiation. But unlike the, the slides that I showed you just now, for very small antenna, we also have a transition zone between near field and far field. In other words, this is the part where near field and far field overlap each other. So this is only um, specifically meant for very small antenna, antenna which has length shorter than half of the wavelength. Okay, so here's a graphical illustration of how the field um, propagate in near field and far field. In near field, most of the field actually reflected back or scattered back to the antenna, so it hardly propagate. And at far field, you can see that the field starts to propagate away. Okay, so here's, here's the details of the near field and far field. For reactive near field, the electric field and the magnetic field are actually 90 degrees out of phase from each other, and it is very kind of complicated. The interaction of the fields are very complicated, very hard to predict. And most of these fields are actually reflected back or scattered back to the antenna. So in other words, the absorption loss is very high. The absorption loss is very high, so high that it, it can hardly propagate. So you can see that the field decay very fast. It decay at 1 over r cubed, 1 over r to the power of 3. r is the distance um, of um, wave propagation. So when the field is able to penetrate to the re radiative near field region, so you can see that at this region here, the electromagnetic fields start to propagate away, but still there are certain portion of its energy are still being scattered back to the antenna. So it is more predictable, but then um, it's still not very easy to analyze because some of the fields are radiating out and some of the fields are scattered back or reflected back to the antenna. But at this, at this point here, the field decay at uh, short, um, decay slower. It decays at one over r square instead of one over r cube. So when the field um, is strong enough and it it radiates to the far field region, 
then you can see that almost most of the field can propagate out from the antenna. So you can see that the field decay at only one over R. So it decays very slowly. So if we look at it in terms of power density, then it decays at one over R square. So we also call this the inverse square law distribution, the inverse square law distribution. Okay, you can see that when the field is at, at the far field region, the electric field is actually 90 degrees away from the magnetic field. And the electric field and magnetic fields both are actually 90 degrees or, or they are actually perpendicularly orthogonal to the propagation direction Z. So this kind of field where we have E field and H field perpendicular to each other, and both fields are perpendicular to the propagation direction. We call this kind of field the transverse electromagnetic field, or in short, TEM field. So why is it that the field is in TEM form? So here's a graphical illustration why the electric field and the magnetic field are in TEM form when it propagates at the far field region. So we can see that the electric field are actually polarized vertically upwards or downwards. You can see that the electric field actually polarized vertically downwards at certain frequency. And at the same time, um, you can try to use your right hand rule to, to have a look at, at the magnetic field. You can see that the magnetic field is actually um, polarized in um, horizontal direction. So when both these field coexist at the same time, you can see that you have electric field propagate polarized in the top to bottom direction, either top or bottom direction, and the magnetic field polarized in the um, horizontal direction. When both of them join together, and when they are radiating outwards, you can see that it becomes TEM wave. So this, this is why it's a transverse electromagnetic wave. Now, of course, at different frequency, scientists actually categorize the electromagnetic wave using different names. So when the field is in the range of 10 um, to the power of three meters, we call it the, radi the radio waves. When it's around the range of 10 to the power of negative two meters, it's known as microwave. And then when it goes higher, when the frequency goes higher, it becomes infrared and at around, 0 0.5 times 10 to the power of negative 6 meter, you can see we are at the visible um, light region. So in other words, light, our light spectrum is actually part of the, the electromagnetic wave. So when it goes further higher, you can see that the highest frequency is about, is known as the gamma ray. In fact, the highest um, frequency detected by gamma ray is about 10 to the power of 28, 10 to the power of 28 hertz. For telecommunication, um, we normally work in the range of 300 megahertz to 30 gigahertz in the range in the range here. If I'm not mistaken, um, 4G works somewhere until 6 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz for 4G. But for 5G, the upcoming 5G, it can go above 30 gigahertz. And actually, telecommunication engineers is actually targeting 100 gigahertz and as the um, highest frequency for our 5G um, telecommunication technology. So, so far, we are still somewhere around this region for telecommunication purposes. Now, a good antenna actually has, uh, the, has a radiation in the omnidirectional pattern. So what do we, how do we define omnidirection? Omnidirection looks like the shape of a donut if you look at it from this diagram from the 3d view it looks exactly like a donut and if you look at the 2d view if you look from the top from the top if you look if you're looking from the top down you can see that the radiation power density is actually almost uniform throughout all directions in other words in the northeast southwest direction the power received by a particular person standing in any of this angle would be more or less the same. For example, if you are standing here and you are calling a friend, you are standing in the east direction and you are calling a friend in the west or in the north direction, you can see that both of them can actually receive almost the equivalent amount of power because um, the, if the antenna is properly designed in an omnidirectional in a way. Now, if you cut this omnidirectional um, radiation pattern 
vertically, if you cut it vertically, you can see that it looks like two eight shape and eight shape or an infinity shape. Now we have different kinds of radiation patterns around. So the best, the one that we um, normally use for for our mobile phone is of course the omnidirectional no pattern. But of course, there are some other beam which is targeted at certain direction, especially those which is used for radar purposes. So we have pencil beam, which has a very sharp directional pencil shaped pattern, and it is used very often used for radar in detecting certain devices, for example, for, for detecting um, enemy plane, enemy war plane coming, you would like to lock, lock it to a certain direction and see where it's flowing. And we also have fan beam, which has a fan shape. You can see that the, ra the radiation pattern is actually wider compared to pencil beam, which is very sharp and very fine. And then we have also shaped beam, with, which has non-uniform and patternless that, which is radiating in a patternless way. Um, there are also many different kinds of antennas available around, although um, some of the most um, commonly antenna that we see in our daily lives so yeah, is our wire antennas. You can see that most of our television is actually hooked up to our wire antennas. Uh, there, there are actually more than more antennas than, than those that we normally see in our daily lives. So horn antennas, uh, it looks like the, uh, the horn of a trumpet. We have also reflected antennas, which are normally used for radio astronomy. And we also have printed antennas, which are installed embedded in, in our, into our handphone. And this um, printer antennas is only available about 20 years ago. Before that, we used wire antennas for our handphone. Of course, there are also some other antennas which are not so common, like loop antennas, array antennas, slot, bow tie, and helical antennas. So today, we are only going to look at these uh, four kinds of antenna which are more common, which are more um, prevalent that can be seen nowadays. So horn antennas, like I told you earlier on, it looks like the horn of a trumpet, and it's normally used in uh, the anechoic chamber uh, and also in a radio telescope. So you, you can see that we have actually four kinds of horn antennas. The, what, the first one is the one which plant in the electric field dimension. The second one is the one where the field plant in the H dimension, the magnetic field dimension. And we also have pyramidal horn antennas and conical horn antennas. Um, so reflector antennas are normally used in radio astronomy. So it is also the, the most um, efficient antenna. It has the highest aperture efficiency. It is used to capture antennas from um, the outer space. So we actually have two kinds of antennas, which is commonly used in um, radio telescopes installed in our te radio telescope. The first one is a cast grain antenna. It was actually invented by someone called Laurent Cusgrain about, well, close to 100 years ago. And the other one is known as Gregorian antenna, which was invented by, if I'm not mistaken, James Greg Gregory. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was invented by James Gregory. So the, the difference between these two kinds of antennas is the actually lies and at the secondary reflector. So if you have a look at the secondary reflector here, you can see that they are the only part which is different. So for Casper's antenna, the secondary reflector is actually pointing upwards. It's actually facing upwards. And it's actually made of hyperbola. Um, it's in hyperbolic shape. And the second, for Gregorian antennas, this is actually in the secondary reflector. It's actually in ellipsoidal shape. Both are actually very popular in radio telescope. So for Casper's antenna, you can see that it was used in the Atacama Large Millimeter Array um, interferometer and Gregorian antenna is also used in green bank um, telescope. So you can see that they are actually widely used in the radio astronomy. Both have their own um, advantages and disadvantages. So this is how reflected antennas work. So it actually collects signal, um, collimated signal from the outer space, and then it would focus all the signals to the secondary reflector. And the secondary reflector would actually scatter the signal down to the re receiver which is um, placed somewhere below the focal point um, beneath the primary reflector. Okay, so now, like I mentioned just now, wire antennas is probably one of the 
smooth, commonly found antennas in our daily life. You can see why antennas in our cars. You can also see why antennas hook up to our television. So this is actually a kind of wire antenna. So the one used, the wire antenna used in our cars is known as a monopole antenna. And the, the antenna used in our, which is connected to our television is known as a dipole antenna. So in, in actually more specifically, um, in a more specific sense, this antenna is known as a Yagi Uda antenna. It's actually known as a Yagi Uda antenna. It's actually a, a modification from the dipole antenna. You can see that we have our dipole antenna here in the middle. And between this dipole antenna, you will have a reflector at the back and, a, and some director at the front. So it's meant to accumulate the energy, the electromagnetic energy, and send it to the dipole antenna at the middle here. So this is how wire antenna works. Um, you can see that the, the length, the dimension of a wire antenna, especially a dipole antenna, is about is actually half of the wavelength. I'll explain to you why um, shortly. And since um, the monopole antenna is actually the the simplified version of the dipole antenna, you can see that actually it actually cut this wire dipole antenna into half, and we put metallic plate. Um, in between the two the two wires before we cut it. So once you put uh, insert a metallic plate, you can actually get rid of the bottom antennas at the bottom and it becomes a monopole antenna. So that's why a monopole antenna is actually half the size of a dipole antenna. If the dipole antenna is um, lambda divided by two, half of the wavelength, then the monopole antenna is actually quarter of the wavelength. So why do we fix the length of the antenna to be half a wavelength. So the reason is because when the antenna is half its wavelength, um, the impedance is actually at its minimum. So we know that impedance according to Ohm's law, when I'm talking about the impedance, it includes the radiated resistance and also the internal imp resistance of the antenna. So this impedance is actually according to Ohm's law is V divided by I. So if the antenna is half the wavelength, then the magnetic field or the current actually peaks at the middle. So in other words, if it peaks at the middle, if the current is the highest at the middle, then the impedance would actually be at its lowest position. So say for example, instead of half wavelength, we, can, we built a full wavelength antenna. So you can see that it, the, the current is actually at its minimum, almost zero in at the middle. So if it's at a zero, then, then V divided by zero, the impedance will be very large. So instead, so instead of having a very large impedance, we want the impedance to be as small as possible. So that's why we use a half wavelength antenna. So if you have a look at this diagram here at the bottom, impedance versus the length of the a dipole antenna, you can see that at about half its wavelength, the antenna is purely resistive. The antenna is purely resistive the um is almost um resistive there's no reactive components there virtually none okay now let's have a look at printed antennas this is the antenna that i'm going to show you when we build our implantable antennas later on so i'm going to spend some time explaining in printed antennas it's also known as planar antennas they also give it a di different uh different name, planar antenna. So some would like to call it printed antennas, some would like to call it planar antennas because they're actually flat in the form of um, planar form. So it's also known as a planar antenna. So you can see that this is a diagram uh, of a handphone diagram. You can see that we have antennas here and also we are, have another antenna here. And besides the two antennas, we have uh, a layer of um, ground signal, uh, earth signals here. Okay, so this is the, the feet of the antenna. And this is a, a, a koi antenna. Okay. So there are two kinds of connecting signals to antennas. In other words, in feeding the a planar printed antenna. The first one is using CPW feeding, called planar waveguide feeding, like the one that I showed you just now, like this diagram here. You can see that we have two ground plane 
here and in the middle of these two ground plane we have a, a, a an antenna a strip connected to the antenna so this is known as a cpw feed antenna so it looks some, something like this you have a strip in the middle with two ground pl plane at the two edge at the two sides of the antenna is a cpw feed antenna the other kind of antenna which is also quite popular in mobile phone design is a micro strip feeding and printed antenna where the ground plane is at the other side of the substrate so a substrate consists of the top surface and the bottom surface so if the top surface is is built you um, the strip is built on the top surface then the bottom surface we have ground plane built on the bottom surface okay now let's have a look at um, the band dedicated for um, our biomedical devices. So according to the Federal Communication of Com Commission um, in the US, United States, um, the MICS band, which range, which ranges from 402 megahertz to 405 megahertz are dedicated for diagnostic and treatment purposes. And we have also another band, which is known as the industrial scientific and medical band, which ranges from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz. So this band, the purpose of this band is to allow microwave heat treating, especially for patients which, who are suffering from cancers. So we might want to insert heat, apply heat to kill some of the cancerous cells, some of the malignant cells. And it is also used for wake-up application. So if you want to save the battery, um, the energy of the battery embedded in the implantable medical devices, then very often they would be put into sleep mode. They would only be triggered when we need to activate the device. So how do we trigger it? We actually use, um, we actually insert signal through which lies in the ISM band to trigger the IMD device the biomedical device to to wake to activate it so implantable antennas um, there are actually three kinds of implantable antennas we have in in body communications implantable antennas these implant implantable antennas are used to communicate between different kinds of imds embedded in our in our body we also have in on body communication where implantable devices are uh, the signal from implant, implantable antennas in our body are actually sent out to the skin. So some of the, the antenna, some of the devices are actually attached onto the surface of the skin. So if you want to communicate between these two kinds of devices, the device inside our body and the device on the skin, then we use in-on body communication. We also have in-off body communication where the Im implantable antennas communicate with the base station, which is some distance away from the patient's body. So normally it operates over two meters away from the patient's body. So graphically, this is what I'm trying to say just now. So when you have two or more antennas, um, two more or more implantable medical devices communicating among each other, then it's known as in-in-body communication. When the IMD is communica communicating with certain device attached on the body attach onto our skin, then it's known as in-on body communication. And if the device is communica communicating with some device outside uh, more than two meters away from the patient, then it's known as in-off body communication. So here's another diagram. And I think I'll just skip this, this diagram. It actually shows us how in-off communication device uh, communicate or transfer signal to the base station. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the literature review, some of the existing um, antenna design that we can find in um, our literature. So you can see that most of the antenna design is actually single band antenna. In other words, they can only su support either the ISM band or the MICS band. So you can see that um, here are the list of the design which has been published in um, very established journals. So you can see that they can only support the MICS band. Now, one of the reasons why most of the design, most of the implantable antenna design can only support one band is because if you have a look back at the band um, spectrum of MICS and ISM band, let me just go back a short while back to the, the um, slides on 
MITF band and IFM band, you can see that there is actually a very large gap between the MICF band and the IFM band. The MICF band somewhere in lies somewhere in the megahertz region, and the IFM band lies somewhere in the gigahertz region. So you can see that the gap is very large. The gap between these two kinds of device, these two kinds of antennas, and we know that the antenna depends the the dimension or the geometrical structure of the antenna depends on the wavelength on the wavelength like for example dipole antenna depends on half wavelength monopole depends on quarter wavelength so it actually depends on the wavelength of the antenna so there's no way it, I mean, it's not possible but then it will be very hard to build an antenna which can support fps band and ism band at the same time because they depends on a wavelength so, for example, if you want to build an antenna which operate on MICF band, then it will definitely be larger than an antenna which can support ISM band, which has shorter wavelengths. So this is the reason why most of the antenna that you can find available in the market is actually single band antenna. Right? For example, these antennas here support only MICF band, and these antennas here, designed by different various kinds of researchers in uh, different kind of the world different parts of the world, the, uh, you can see that they only support ISM band. Of course, we still have antenna which can support both I MICF band and ISM band, although there are not many of them. We can, I can only find three of them so far. And they have their own um, weakness as well. They have, they have areas which need further improvement as well. For example, they are either very large or they, their return loss is very low too low, uh, not, not very high. In other words, we can actually further improve their return losses. So this also drives us, uh, motivates us to come up with our own antenna design, which is able to um, overcome some of the um, shortcomings of the available existing antenna. So firstly, the problem of the current IMDs, um, implantable antennas is that it can only support either the MICS band or the IFM band. Most of the antennas are single band, like I mentioned earlier on. And if we want to support both bands, then we might have to install two different kinds of antennas into our IMDs. So that would make our IMD look very bulky. It looks very big and very cumbersome to carry around. So our objectives now um, is to design an antenna which is very small, small enough, and at the same time, it is able to support more than one band, a, a multi-band antenna. So we are going to test our antenna, simulate it, and experiment, experimentally validate the performance of the antenna. Okay, um, so this, this work was actually published late last year, December 2019, in one of the Wiley journals. So, some of the challenges that we face when we are designing our antenna is that um, we, it's very hard to build a small antenna, a very small antenna. Like I told you earlier on, antenna is actually wavelength dependent. In other words, if we want to build an MICS antenna, then it's going to be larger than an ISM antenna because MICS band has lower frequency, which gives us larger wavelengths. So also, our human bodies are actually very lossy. So most of, so we will have to make sure that our antenna is efficient enough so that it can suppress some of the most of the loss sustained in our body, and it has to be abide, it has to abide by the SAR a specific absorption rate the electromagnetic energy absorbed by our body we have to make sure that it can it could be minimized, and of course implantable antennas tend the resonant frequency tends to shift when it is implanted at different body at different patients so frequency detuning issue might occur when it's implanted at different individuals. We would have to overcome this problem as well. So firstly, the size, the size of an antenna, like I said, MICS band, if you're building an antenna which is catered for the MICS band, then it's going to be definitely larger than those catered for the ISM band because the frequency um, is much lower for MICS band compared to the ISM band. So if you want to build an antenna which can support both bands, then it's, it could be quite challenging. The second problem is that our body is very lossy. In other words, um, most of the energy decay very fast when it penetrates into our body. So um, we are going to simulate, um, this is the conductivity that we can find in, in different parts of the, the organs. Um, this information is actually obtained from the Italian Research Council um, from this website. 
and also the relative permittivity is also very high. You can see that it's actually very high. Um, this information is also obtained from the same website in the Italian Research Council. So if you have a look at the theoretical uh, the, the formulas um, gov which govern the laws, you can see the attenuation loss is actually governed by this equation here. And omega is the angular frequency. And the reflection loss is governed by the reflection coefficient, which is, which is shown here. And you can see that omega is the angular frequency. So what is trying to show you, what I'm, I'm trying to show you here is that when the frequency increases, when this frequency increases, when the frequency increases, you can see that the loss increases proportionately as well. So that's why the higher is the frequency, the harder it is for us to suppress the loss of an antenna. So um, in our body, the absorption rate is also very high. So you can see that the electric near field increases the absorbed power and the specific absorption rate as well. You can see that when the electric field increases, the absorption, the power absorption is also, it, it, it also increases proportionately. So the same goes to the SAR, specific absorption rate. Electric field increases, specific absorption rate also increases. So the third problem is that IEEE has, has also has already um, come up with two standards, the C95.1-1999 and the C95.1-2005 standard to govern the limit of the absorption rate. We must make sure that when designing our antenna, our antenna must not um, exceed these two limits. So the first standard, um, Tell, dictates that one gram of tissue in the shape of a cube is to be below, is to be restricted below 1.6 watts per kilogram. Oh, and the second standard ah, so um, okay. message dictates that 10 gram of tissue in the shape of a cube is to be less than 2 watts per kilogram. So we have to make sure that uh, both of these standards have to be, we have to comply to these two standards when designing our antennas. So the first, the fourth challenge is frequency detuning. We can see that different people with different age, different gender, different weight, different height, different health conditions. And also if we implant our antenna to different organs, the um, resonant frequency would also shift to a different position. So you can see that the resonant frequency is actually governed by resonant frequency at free space divided by the square root of the dielectric constant. So when the dielectric constant changes, the resonant frequency would also change as well. So we have to make sure that our um, the frequency detuning problem can be solved by making sure that the bandwidth of our resonant band is wide enough. So this is how we come up with our first our antenna design, our multi-band antenna design. Our antenna can actually support two bands. So the it, it kind of um, um, challenging because we have to make sure that the antenna can support two bands. So the first step that we build, that we um, apply when designing our antenna is to come up with uh, firstly an antenna which can only support one single band. So how do we did it? So first we choose a band which lies somewhere close to the ISM band, uh, an antenna, uh, a design of frequency which lies somewhere near the ISM band. So we have picked the 2.5 gigahertz as the resonant frequency. And we use um, this equation here to calculate the frequency dependent effective permittivity of this single band antenna. So by using this um, equation, uh, these are some of the equations lying within the main equation in equation one here. You can see that we have the um, cutoff frequency um, of the TE0 surface wave mode, and we have the effective permittivity for a frequency independent um, parameter. And then we have the W and B parameter as well, which is which are illustrated in the second is the in the subsequent slide. Um, w and B is actually the width and the the length of the antenna. So you can see that by substituting all these parameters, um, which is quite troublesome, it takes us some time, we finally come up with um, the length of the antenna, which is about close to 15.9 millimeter. When we try to simulate this um, in HFSS, in um, 
high frequency high frequency structure simulator. We we find that it's actually very close to the anten the antenna length that we have theoretically calculated. I think it's somewhere close to here, which is about 14 millimeter or, or 14.5 millimeter. So these are the tools that we have used in designing our antenna. First, we simulate our antenna using high fr frequency structure simulator. If if you don't have HFSS, you can also try CST as well. They both work very well. And then we um, use Rogers RO3210 substrate to build, to fabricate our antenna. And then we tested our antenna on using syn synthetic tissues, fake tissues, which is emulate real tissues. We also tested it on um, uh, means pork meat. Okay, so this is how we tested our antennas. So the antennas is it's actually embedded below the skin surface and above the fat and muscle um, tissues. So it's embedded somewhere in between these two skin and fat muscle uh, tissues. So these are the um, parameters, properties, the um, constitutive properties that we have used for the different kinds of tissues. The skin, we use um, dielectric constant of 40, 45, conductivity 0.73, Thickness is 0 0.75, fat is 5.54, 0 0.04 and 2.48 um, thickness, muscle is 56.5, dielectric constant, 0 0.8 conductivity, and thickness of 2.48 millimeter. And the substrate, this is the standard substrate for R3210. Okay, so like, like I told you, first we design a single band antenna. Um, using a CPW feed. So you can, you can see that it's a CPW feed with two ground plane at both sides of the antenna. So it actually, you can see that it actually resonates somewhere close to 2.5 gigahertz, which is, which is very close to the theoretical calculation result. So in order to make sure that um, it can resonate at two bands, we try to expand it into an E-shaped antenna. So you can see that by expanding it into E-shape, the second band starts to appear. And at the same time, the first band is shifted towards higher frequency around higher than four gigahertz. So now we overlap, overlay two E-band antennas together so that the, the result would become better. So you can see that by overlaying two E-band antenna, E-shaped antenna together, the return loss increases higher. The return loss actually increases higher. So uh, it takes us some time. So we have to perform some parametric adjustment by finally reaching, coming, um, reaching this final geometrical design, the geometrical structure. So you can see that at the end of the day, we managed to develop an antenna which spikes, which has resonant frequent, which resonates at the MICS band and also the ISM band at these two band. And this is how uh, it's going to look a bit complicated because we want to make sure that it can support two bands. So this is how the final antenna design looks like. So these are the parameters, the dimensions of the, the antennas. And you can see that it's actually very, very small. The design is roughly about two centimeter times um, close times 1.5 centimeter. So it's a very small antenna. And we tested our antennas using synthetic skin, synthetic skin, um, which emulate real human skin. And we, we embed it into this synthetic skin and use and connect it to a vector network analyzer to see how the return loss perform how it fares in, in when it's embedded into this synthetic skin. We also, and we also tried another method so that we can confirm our result better. So we use a mock means pork meat and, and embed our antenna into this means pork meat. And then we use vector network analyzer to check the, the return losses of the antennas. So th this is the simulated result using HFSS. You can see that it, resonates at the MICS band and the ISM band. And the rest of the band, the rest of the frequency spectrum, you can see that it, it's actually suppressed below 10 dB, which is quite low to ensure that there are no noise um, coupled to the antenna. So when we tried um, experimentally tested it using synthetic skin, you can see that the, the result is quite good. There is, there's no frequency de detuning. 
or in other words, or it, the frequency detuning result is actually quite small. You can see that they still resonate at the two designated band. So again, when we try using means um, means pop mid, you see means pop um, are not human skin. Um, they, they are actually um, the skin of a, of a pig. So you can see that the constitutive properties would definitely be a little bit different from our human being. So you can see that there are certain frequency detuning issue here. You can see that there are frequency detuning issue here. The resonant frequency actually shifted, but anyhow, we can still see that um, certain part of it still lies with, within the MICS band and the ISM band. So you can still see that within the MICS band and the, IMA, the ISM band, the return loss is still higher than 10 dB. So this is the current distribution of the antenna. You can see that the MICS band and the ISM band, um, they actually, the peak current density is lies at different parts of the antenna. When, at the, when we are operating at the MICS band, the middle part of the antenna has the highest current density. When we are operating at the ISM band, you can see that the outer region, the outer boundary, and also the strip has the highest current density. In other words, every part of the antenna is actually very useful. We, we can't, you, we can't um, uh, get rid of any part of this antenna. They must be there in order for it to, to resonate at the MICF and the ISM band. So we also need to check the SAR, the specific absorption rate, to make sure that it's below the limitation um, set by the IEEE standards. We can see that both of them, we can see that when it's operate, operating in the MICS band, the limit is um, 1.4 times 10 to the power of negative two watts per kg. And when it's operating in the ISM band, it's also very low. Both are actually below the limit set by the IEEE standards. So that shows that our antenna is operating quite well and could be embedded into a, a patient's body. So this is the radiation pattern that we obtain from the antenna. So you can see that it's actually omnidirectional. It's actually round in shape. In other words, no matter where you are standing, north, north, east, south, or west, you can still receive the same amount of energy. So the same goes to the ISM band. In fact, the ISM band is better. It's omnidirectional in the E plane and the H plane, the horizontal plane and the ele elevation plane, the E plane and the H plane. Both planes are actually omnidirectional, which, uh, which is actually preferable. So the gain of the antenna is, is um, around negative 18 dBi and around um, negative 19 dBi to negative 17.5 dBi. So we know that, uh, of course, we have already expected this to be low, the gain to be low, because we are going to embed it into the body. But as long as it's above, it's, it's above negative 37 dB, dBi, then it's acceptable. You can see that it's much higher than negative 37 dBi. So, so the gain is still acceptable. It's not too lossy. So this is basically how um, we define our antenna. So and some of the parameters that we need to check to make sure that the antenna works. So as a summary, before I wrap up my presentation today, um, so I'm just going to highlight some of the achievement that we have obtained in designing the antenna. So we have defined a multi-band, a dual band antenna, which operates at both the MICS and the ISM band. So the antenna is quite small. You can see that the dimension is 22 millimeter times 16 millimeter times 1.27 millimeter. This is the thickness of the antenna. And this is the height and width of the antenna. So it's almost like a 20 cent Malaysian coin um, for the antenna, a very small antenna. So it exhibits good radiation characteristics. And the SAR value shows that it can be implanted within the human bodies. So um, it's about six o'clock right now. And I think it's just nice in time for me to wrap up the presentation for today. So these are the references that we have used in designing our antennas. Um, if you're interested, you can actually refer to these references. And I think that's all for my talk today. Thank you. Thanks for um, staying with me for this one hour. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Renisha. Yes. Very nice lecture because <laughs> you combined both the practical aspects of it as well as the
cosmetic side of it because like when any ind like when it's implanted in the human body uh, the cosmetic side is also taken into consideration so by increasing the efficiency and also decreasing the size of the devices which you explained i think it was a very good uh, research topic and uh, hope like the discussions which happened after your lecture will also benefit a lot of young researchers to come up with a lot of researchers on uh, INDs and actinas as well. So thank you very much.